Okay. All right. So breast MRI, as we know, it is a supplemental tool which provides tissue information on high yield spatial resolution, uh, cross-sectional morphology, functional information on perfusion and capillary leakage, uh, tissue relaxation times that can be used for the diagnosis of breast cancer and, diagno and the differential diagnosis of lesions that are enhancing the breast. And it's, it can be very useful to detect occult cancer in both screening and diagnostic settings. There's just so many ways in which we can use breast MRI that's so important for our armamentarium in breast imaging. So breast MRI, unlike mammography, it has a higher sensitivity, as many of us know. And whenever, uh, you know, if you look at comparisons, uh, 87 to 100% uh, sensitivity uh, when you are looking at MAMO plus ultrasound, uh, more than 90% when you combine MAMO plus ultrasound plus MRI. So we just know that it helps with increasing sensitivity in breast cancer detection. Um, and it has a high negative predictive value as well. It's not affected by breast density, which is such a huge uh, thing for us in breast imaging. I mean, even if a woman is receiving a 3D mammogram, uh, dense tissue can still be uh, difficult to find cancers uh, in dense breast tissue if a woman has a 3D mammogram, as incredible as that technology is. So breast MRI can help for that. It uh, does not use ionizing radiation, as you know. So that's, been, that's wonderful for patients who uh, have ongoing radiation concerns. Of course, there are pitfalls. It does lack specificity. There are higher rates of uh, false positives, as we know. It can be uh, expensive, of course, and that's where I think um, we have a great opportunity uh, for uh, breast MRI and breast imaging and providing abbreviated breast MRI uh, to at a lesser cost. And of course, the examination in general takes less time. And then, uh, it, you know, another pitfall is it requires contrast. So the indications for uh, breast MRI, there's so many indications. So for example, if we have a biopsy proven malignancy, we do recommend uh, breast MRI for extensive disease in women. Now, um, this it incredibly varies, I think, across uh, the country. Now, it, I, I do feel that typically now women who are premenopausal, uh, they, I would hope that most institutions are employing that a woman does get a breast MRI if they are biopsy proven, have a biopsy proven malignancy. But, you know, this isn't across the board. If you have a, a patient who is much older, may not be able to tolerate MRI, you know, in her 80s, 90s, has one area that looks positive for um, malignancy and they want to do a lumpectomy, et cetera, uh, breast conservation therapy, then those women are probably not going to end up having a breast MRI. But anyway, we use this uh, to determine extent of disease. Um, as well as the diagnosis of the contralateral breast uh, of contralateral breast cancer in women with newly diagnosed breast cancer, uh, screening women who are high risk. We know that this can be a great tool for those women who have a 25, 20 percent or greater lifetime risk of breast cancer, uh, who are at risk um, due to. Uh, being genetic mutation carriers, uh, radiation to the chest between the ages of 10 and 30, uh, so many factors that go into deeming a woman high risk. Um, and um, assessment to res of response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So if a woman has pretty extensive disease and she receives chemotherapy first, uh, an MRI can be a great tool to uh, determine extent of disease. Uh, evaluation of chest wall invasion with posterior cancers, that can help uh, be incredibly uh, helpful too, to see, is there any pectoralis muscle invasion? And that really can help the surgeon uh, with surgical planning to know if they need to take back to the pectoralis muscle and not leave any residual disease. Um, detection of breast cancer in those patients with axillary metastasis in a negative mammogram. You know, sometimes even when a patient has a diagnostic eval and we scan her axilla with ultrasound, we may not uh, readily see abnormal nodes. However, if the patient is having a breast MRI, uh, we may be able to identify those nodes and then do a second look ultrasound to pinpoint an abnormal node on MRI uh, to aid in diagnosis of a, of a metastatic node. 
And then, of course, um, so those are all obviously contrast enhanced examples where we give contrast to a patient. However, if uh, there are other indications where we don't include, uh, involve, it doesn't involve contrast. And that would be if a patient has silicone implants and we're looking at the integrity of the implant. So, um, as we know that if we're assessing for uh, implant integrity, if it's saline implants, our first line is clinical exam and mammography. Uh, for silicone, it would be a non-contrast MRI to look for rupture. So this is an example for those of you who are new, absolutely new to breast MRI uh, of, uh, of essentially how the examination works. So. Uh, Basically, the patient is laying face down in this uh, area here. Uh, this would be our your coils where your breasts would fall through. Uh, and so the patient's laying on her stomach. Uh, you know, not a comfortable exam. Uh, patients, we commonly have uh, patients who, um, you know, say, that oh, that wasn't the greatest thing in the world. Uh, and it's particularly, you know, their neck hurts by the end of the exam or something like that. So not a, not a comfortable exam. Uh, but, you know, if your technologists are very skilled, uh, they can really employ uh, tips and tricks to try to uh, create an environment of comfort as much as possible, given the circumstances. Okay. So to prepare, obviously, clinical history plays a role. What's the reason for exam? You know, is it uh, for screening? Uh, are they high risk? Is it for extent of disease? Do they have a, a, a known malignancy? Are we looking at implants? Um, you know, all of these things. What is their renal function? Are they okay to be receiving contrast? So, um, Comparisons are important. It is important to have a prior mammogram, a recent mammogram, so that if you need to uh, correlate with whatever you're seeing on MRI with the mammogram, you have that. Uh, the timing is important too. So typically, particularly in those women who are having a screening uh, MRI, uh, we want them to be screened typically ten, seven to 10 days after their menstrual cycle, because otherwise the background parenchymal enhancement may be too pronounced and delay, or, de or I'm sorry, decrease sensitivity and specificity. So imaging them seven to 10 days after menstrual cycle is important. And, you know, do not delay, though, an MRI in the setting of a cancer diagnosis. So regardless of, you know, where they are in their menstrual cycle, if they are, they have a positive um, malignancy, known biopsy proven malignancy, uh, do not delay. Go ahead regardless and let them have their evaluation. Okay. So, you know, the imaging sequences, it, this definitely, I think this varies across the country. And just in my experience of where I've practiced and trained, it definitely does vary. But, you know, for the most part, most practices who employ breast MRI will have something along the lines of these imaging sequences. So uh, T1 axial with pre-contrast without fat saturation, a T2 axial, a T1 axial pre-contrast with fat sat. And then, of course, the images where uh, we obtain after injecting the contrast, that will vary across institutions. Um, you know, whether it's 20, just 20 seconds after injection and then two minutes and then another two minutes. Uh, so that all varies. Um, subtraction images where we're subtracting the pre from the, pro, the post-contrast images, which really um, helps us to delineate, you know, is this true cancer or a true suspicious enhancing mass versus or or some sort of finding on MRI versus, you know, is this just related to post-operative changes, particularly in those patients who've had surgery? Um, the subtracted maximum uh, intensity projection image is also really important for us as well uh, in, in uh, delineating what is, you know, quote unquote, real or significant versus not. And then our CAD color mapping, where we're looking at the kinetic pattern uh, of these um, findings in the breast. Okay, so, um, you know, 
first thing to note is your breast density on your MRI, it doesn't necessarily correlate with your density on mammography. So that's important to note. And we do report the density or typically in a report uh, for MRI, we report the density. So um, these are just some examples of what I had mentioned in the subsequent slides of imaging sequences. This is the T1 pre uh, without fat sat where you are seeing um, that, you know, the fat is not saturated out. That's why it's bright here um, on this sequence. Uh, this is a T2, of course, where, um, you know, you're going to have things that enhance that, you know, quote unquote, light up on the sequence, such as, you know, cysts and, and vessels and that sort of thing. And these are some more examples of the previous imaging sequences I was discussing. Of course, once we've inject contrast, uh, you know, a simple technique I, I teach the trainees, if you're not able to know if the image they're showing you uh, is contrast enhanced or not, look at the heart, look at the vessels. And if you see that they are enhancing, you know that this patient has received contrast. It sounds so trivial, but it can be very helpful when you're trying to figure out what sequence is which, particularly on an examination, uh, like the core exam or, or something like that. So these are just some examples. And then these are examples of a subtracted image where we're subtracting the pre from the post contrast images to create these images to determine what is, you know, what is truly significant in the breast versus what is not. Um, a subtracted um, MIP image and then our color mapping. And then here we are with the breast density. So um, typically on a breast MRI, we are going to uh, report the density, whether it's of fatty, where you just have just some wisps of fibroglandular tissue here, as you can see here, uh, this is these images, as you can tell, are are without fat suppression because they the uh, fat appears brighter or whiter on these sequences. Um, scattered breast density, where you start to see areas of fibroglandular tissue, heterogeneously dense, where again we start to see an increased degree of the breast tissue, and then extremely dense, uh, where um, the breast density is at its uh, there is more fibroglandular tissue uh, when in comparison to the degree of fatty tissue. So reviewing an MRI. So everybody kind of does it a little differently, I think. And I think a lot of times the way uh, radiologists approaches uh, MRI interpretation is based largely maybe where you trained and how you were taught, um, or maybe you attended a course and that is how they reviewed it. But I think there is some variability with that. But um, essentially what I do um, and what I've been taught and uh, picked up along the way is I typically will look at the T1 pre without fat sat uh, for I looking for fat containing lesions, uh, looking at particularly the T1 pre without fat sat is good to look at the breast composition to determine, you know, are they, if, are they fatty, scattered, hetero, or extremely uh, dense breasted. Uh, T2, obviously, our fluid sensitive sequence, looking for cysts, looking to see if, uh, if I'm trying to figure out if something's a lymph node, T2 can be a good sequence, of course. Uh, fibroadenomas, uh, particularly on T2, can help uh, me to figure out if it's a fibroadenoma. And then remember that, you know, typically we think about if it's T2 uh, hyperintense that it's benign, but we must remember that there is one malignancy that tends to be T2 hyperintense, and that is a mucinous carcinoma. And that is something important for uh, trainees to remember, particularly when they're testing. So uh, in the dynamic contrast enhanced series, the things we're looking for is there motion between the pre and the initial post images. Um, you know, is there any artifact on your subtraction, your MIP, your color CAD images? Uh, and then the initial post contrast uh, is when invasive cancer is most evident, okay? And I will go into that a little bit more in subsequent slides. And then delayed post contrast, um, remember that ductal carcinoma in situ is going to be most evident. Um, and then as far as your CAD color map, we're going to use that when indicated. Now, most breast imagers will say we don't really hang our hats on CAD and our kinetic, uh, our kinetic assessment when really trying to figure out um, 
if something is suspicious or not. And and I'll talk about that in subsequent slides too. A lot of us use the the saying, you know, morphology trumps kinetics, and uh, I will, you know, kind of explain what that means in subsequent slides. Okay. So the kinetic curve assessment. So tumor angiogenesis is postulated to explain lesion enhancement. These lesions need to feed off of the proliferation of blood vessels and they grow. And then they, uh, as a result, um, this process is what is postulated to explain why on MRI these lesions enhance. So the contrast kinetic information, it's, it's more critical in determining the possibility of malignancy in cases with more benign appearing morphology, okay? So you, could, you can have a cancer that doesn't necessarily look irregularly irregular. Um, it can look, you know, perhaps uh, somewhat oval and circumscribed, but looking at the kinetics is, is going to be important in those situations uh, to really delineate, is this something really benign or is this something that is malignant? that is fooling me. Um, the enhancement char characteristics over time during the injection of contrast is important to obviously assess. Um, in our kinetic analysis, we assess that by using color maps, and that's based on pixel by pixel curve analysis and or curves that can be generated manually or by CAD. I would say now most of us are getting are having these curves being generated uh, by CAD, which is very, very um, useful and efficient in a in busy clinical practices um, all over the country. So and then um, we want to essentially report the worst appearing kinetic curve. So essentially you find the most avidly enhancing region and then you want to put your, uh, uh, you want to put your region of interest over that area to see what uh, kinetic curve is demonstrated and essentially you know, report the worst appearing curve. Okay, so with the kinetic assessment in the initial phase, um, that is within the first two minutes or until the peak. So um, essentially that means you've injected your contrast and this initial phase is within that first two minutes uh, of injection. And so um, we have different phases, whether it's slow, medium, or fast in the kinetic assessment. And um, you know, as this slide shows, slow, you have less than 50% increase in your signal intensity within the first two minutes, medium, 50 to 100, and then fast, you have greater than 100% increase in signal intensity within the first two minutes. And then the delayed phase is after the first two minutes or after that peak. Okay, so we talked about um, earlier about the the, the curves in, in the kinetic assessment. So we have what's th uh, called, you know, the different types of curves. So we have three curves, and this is important for uh, people to be aware of. So you have the type one curve where uh, you have a per persistent essentially curve uh, where you may have an initial, um, an initial rapid um you know, uh, rise of the curve, but then the curve essentially just continues to rise and it doesn't drop off. Uh, and I'll show you some examples and uh, an example in a moment. And that persistent curve um, essentially equates to a continued greater than 10% increase in signal over time. And that is, so the persistent kinetic curve is known as a type one curve. And it typically is demonstrated as blue on your, on CAD or your uh, color mapping. Uh, blue, uh, these types of curves are associated with particularly benign lesions. So fibroadenomas can demonstrate a, a persistent curve or, um, or some sort of benign entity in the breast. Plateau is uh, affiliated with type two kinetic curves where the signal intensity does not change over time after its initial rise. So essentially you have the initial rise of the curve and then the curve stays flat typically. And that um, is uh, particularly